The search for truth requires a willingness to lay aside preconceived ideas and obey new convictions. Nowhere is this more evident than in a study of the Sabbath. Because the Sabbath is very precious to all who have been convicted to worship on the seventh day of the week, it can be emotionally devastating to be presented with evidence that Saturday is not the biblical Sabbath. Rather than rejecting the Sabbath because it contradicts previous assumptions, all should commit to study the subject thoroughly. Careful study reveals the truth and allows the Holy Spirit time to settle a person into that truth so that he cannot be shaken. It was not until a few hundred years before the Savior came that a continuous weekly cycle came into use in the calendar of Babylon. Throughout history, there have been weeks of many different lengths. In Africa, weeks ranged in length anywhere from three to eight days long. In South America, the Maya had five-day weeks, others had three and four-day weeks. The ancient Etruscans and the Romans used an eight-day week. As recently as 1790, the French adopted a calendar with a 10-day week. Beginning August 26, 1929, the Soviet Union had first five-day and later six-day weeks until June 26, 1940, when a seven-day week was finally restored. Between A.D. 79 to A.D. 81, the Emperor Titus constructed public baths at the base of the Esculin Hill in Rome. These baths, known as the Baths of Titus, had many mural designs created by the artist Famulus. On one of the walls in these baths was a stick calendar. It is one of the earliest Roman depictions of the seven-day planetary week. This calendar reveals the pagan planetary week originally began on Saturn's day. Saturday in the early Julian calendar was not the seventh day, but the first, followed by Sunday, then Monday, and finally ending on Dies Veneris, or the modern Friday. It was not until the Council of Nicaea in the 4th century that the seven-day planetary week was finally standardized in the Julian calendar to begin on Sunday and end on Saturday. Satan, in his deceptive device of providing two counterfeit worship days, has hidden the truth. If the Jews at the time of Christ were keeping the wrong Sabbath, he would have corrected it. Since he did not, we can safely assume they were keeping the true Sabbath. It is true that the Savior would have corrected the Israelites if they had been worshiping on the wrong day. The very fact that he did not is evidence that 
at that time they were worshiping on the true Sabbath. Additional evidence that the Israelites were keeping the true Sabbath during the Savior's time on earth is found in the fact that Saturday did not exist in the Roman Julian calendar of the day. The Julian calendar at that time had an eight-day week. The Israelites were still worshiping by the calendar of Moses, not the calendar of their Roman conquerors. Many people assume Saturday is the biblical Sabbath because the Jews worship on that day. It is claimed the Jews have never lost the Sabbath, and this supposition is accepted as conclusive proof Saturday must therefore be the true Sabbath of the Bible. Saturday is not the ancient Sabbath of creation, nor of Moses, or of Yehoshua. Under intense persecution, the Jews themselves modified their calculation of spiritual time. Patriarch Hillel II, president of the Sanhedrin, was himself responsible for a change that ultimately led to the acceptance of Saturday as the Sabbath. Jewish scholars are fully aware the calendar they now use is not the one established by Yahweh and confirmed by Moses at the Exodus. The Jews themselves establish in their own writings Saturday is not the true Bible Sabbath and know unequivocally Saturday is not and could never be the true Sabbath of Yahweh El Shaddai with those who speak the truth concerning this matter, being aware of this since the change was made in the days of Hillel II. Today, many people assume because the papal Gregorian calendar has a continuous weekly cycle of seven days, the week in use is somehow a continuation of the Hebrew week of seven days. They conclude, therefore, Saturday must be the seventh-day Sabbath of Scripture. The facts of history reveal that the modern week, like the pagan Julian calendar that adopted it, comes directly from paganism. It is the continuously cycling pagan week that was not disrupted when the pagan Julian calendar transitioned to the papal Gregorian calendar. Today, the calendar used by Jews is nothing more than a perversion of the original calendar. It has been corrupted by the man-made traditions of the Pharisees recorded in the Talmud. Talmudic tradition teaches if one loses track of when the Sabbath occurs, all one has to do is worship on every seventh day. One who has been traveling in a desert and does not know what day is Sabbath must count six days from the day on which he realizes that he has missed the Sabbath and observe the seventh. This is the rationale used to justify keeping Saturday as the seventh day Sabbath. The argument believers should worship on Saturday because the Jews do is based on the erroneous assumption the Jews would never worship on anything but the true Sabbath. Statements from the Jews prove this assumption is wrong. They did indeed change the Sabbath when they changed the calendar by which the Sabbath was to be calculated. All who desire to honor their Maker by worshiping on His Sabbath will not look to the traditions of the Jews or the calendar of the Catholics. Rather, they will worship Him on the Holy Sabbath as calculated by the original calendar established at creation. This topic is far too important to delegate to someone else's study, be he priest, 
or pastor. Everyone has a responsibility to study for himself the truths of Scripture. Yahuwah has promised to send the Spirit of Truth to lead all who want to know truth into that truth. Please study this vital topic for yourself. Study it with an open mind, a mind that is willing to obey if the Holy Spirit convicts you that it is truth. Winston Churchill is quoted as having said, Most people, sometime in their lives, stumble across truth. Most jump up, brush themselves off, and hurry on about their business, as if nothing had happened. Truth is too important to be brushed aside. Once it is presented, a person has an obligation to determine for himself whether or not it is so, and if it is, to obey that truth. When a man who is honestly mistaken hears the truth, he will either quit being mistaken or cease being honest. I imagine that right now you're feeling a bit like Alice, tumbling down the rabbit hole. Hmm? I can see it in your eyes. You have the look of a man who accepts what he sees because he is expecting to wake up. Ironically, this is not far from the truth. Let me tell you why you're here. You're here because you know something. We are soldiers. Death can come for us at any time, in any place. Now consider the alternative. What if I am right? What if the prophecy is true? Isn't that worth fighting for? Isn't that? Like a drifter I was born
I don't believe it. It's not possible.
I don't believe it. It's not possible.
No. I don't believe it. It's not possible. And now, folks, it's time for Who Do You Trust? Hubba, 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 money, money, money. Who, who, who do you trust?
<clears throat> now, let me share my screen with you here. And we're going to go step by step, take a pencil and pad for those who was dealing with the calculation and was wondering how we deal with it. Just follow us and I'm, I'm going to share my screen with you. Okay, that's my screen. All right. So let's go. All right, yeah, make sure you can all hear me. All right, great. All right, so here we are. We're at the Naval Observatory. The Naval Observatory website. Now, the reason why we go to this website is because when it comes to when time comes in, it's more accurate than any other calculation you can get. Of course, sometimes it, it may be a minute or two off in certain instances, but it's still closer than any other calculation you could have. All right. So what we do is uh, we go to the data services and we hit rise. We hit rise and set twilight table. That's the table we're at here. You go data services, rise and twilight table for an entire year. And you click on that and that takes us to the page we're at. We're here. All right. You go down to form B right here. Why? Because we're not calculating from the United States. We're calculating worldwide. OK worldwide see locations worldwide all right now where where will we will we be calculating from mount sinai see so in order for us to calculate and get some specifics for mount sinai being that there's no calculation from Mount Sinai itself we must put in the degrees so we're going east now and check out the degrees we must put in longitude you got it 33 degrees see all right then we go to the next latitude north right the latitude north is 28 degrees. Why? Because we're coming two hours east of Greenwich. See? There's a calculation from Greenwich that's near or two hours in proximity of time that close to Sinai. So we put that latitude north, 28 degrees, two hours east of Greenwich right now we did this last year and did a calculation for 2013 so let me give you that first right now before I go here let me show you the area from whence the Most High was speaking to the children of Israel our forefathers he was speaking to us he was speaking to us from Mount Sinai as you can see here so we're going to use this in proximity to give you the reckon of times from when the sun comes up in this particular area to give you the first day of the year, starting back when we first calculated it, right? Follow us closely here. So we're going back to the calculation. 33 east, longitude, 28 degrees north, latitude. Two hours east of Greenwich, which is Mount Sinai. Then after that, you hit compute table.
so possible. I didn't say it would be easy, Neo. I just said it would be the truth. Stop. Let me out. Let me out. I want to... It don't matter what you tried to do. You couldn't destroy me. I'm still standing. I'm still strong.
What you tried to do, you couldn't destroy me. I'm still standing. I'm still strong. Mechanics of the Enoch calendar. Step number one, determine the spring equilux or equinox, which both have equal day and night. There exists a debate on Jerusalem equilux as March 16th or the astronomical equinox as March 20th. That day is the last day of the year. Step number two, the following day is the first day of the month. Months 1, 2, 4, 5, 7, 8, 10, and 11 contain 30 days. Months 3, 6, 9, and 12 contain 31 days. This amounts to exactly 364 days per year. Regardless that there are 365 or 366 evenings and mornings between spring equiluxes or equinoxes, there is a forcing of one or two non-days in any given solar cycle. The reason for this is because the distance between equilux to equilux or equinox to equinox in the spring 
is always 365 or 366 days apart, whereas the Enoch calendar is only allowed to have a strict 364 days. Thus, the accuracy of the Book of Enoch as a calendar is already a mathematical impossibility. Do we believe what is presented in the Book of Enoch to be invalid? Not necessarily. We do not believe that there are supposed instructions that produce the Enoch calendar. We believe that it is possible that there is Enoch's observations of our Creator's calendar, and that at that time, the annual trek of the sun may indeed only have been 364 days. Keep in mind, we're only entertaining speculation here, only suggesting why the Enoch calendar does not work today. In fact, if that were the case, it would explain many interesting patterns in the Torah that would have the Sabbath land on very important days. There exists some good material out there explaining some of these patterns, and they are quite astounding. The Enoch calendar may have worked in the past, but it does not work anymore. It's a mathematical impossibility. 364 does not and cannot equal 365. Remember, the calendar Enoch is simply an observation of what once was but may no longer be. This and not to contradict everything that we just said on the Enoch calendar, but here's one thing that is rather important to establish that could relate to the Book of Enoch's lack of credibility. In the opening section of the Book of Enoch, it is suggested that the patterns observed may be actually forever or all the years of the earth. Enoch chapter 72, verses 1 through 2. The book of the courses of the luminaries of the heaven, the relations of each, according to their classes, their dominion and seasons, according to their names, and places of origin, according to their months, which Uriel, the holy angel, who was with me, who is their guide, showed me. And he showed me all their laws exactly as they are, and how it is with regard to all the years of the world and unto eternity, till the new creation is accomplished, which dureth till eternity. So the opening couple of verses in the calendar section of the book of Enoch may actually indeed invalidate the whole calendar. The book of Enoch clearly articulates a mandatory 364 days from spring equal day and night back to spring equal day and night.
in the Torah, we are not given names for the days of the week. There is day one, day two, day three, etc., concluding on day seven, the Sabbath, the only day of the week with a name. Simply because a dominant non-biblical modern calendar used today gives names to the day of the week does not affect the biblical calendar. The biblical calendar came first. However, when it comes to determining whether or not the Jews of the first century kept the Sabbath on Saturday, examining the records of Roman historians and other writers can be very helpful. For this reason, we can look into the writings of Roman historians and other writers to see if Romans associated the Jewish Sabbath with their Saturday or Day of Saturn. If they did associate the Sabbath with their Day of Saturn in the first century or before, this would be undeniable evidence that the Jewish week and Roman week were both keeping the same reoccurring weekly cycle. Seventy to eighty four CE. Frontinus, a Roman soldier who lived from forty CE to one hundred and three CE, wrote a book on military strategy called Stratagematicon in eighty four AD. In it, he writes, "The deified Augustus Vespasian attacked the Jews on the day of Saturn, a day on which it is sinful for them to do any business." The original Latin version of this book has Saturnus for Saturn confirming that the Romans associated the biblical Sabbath day with their day of Saturn, which is on the seventh day of the week and known today as Saturday. This is where the Roman day of Saturday originated, as the day of Saturn. Since this book was written a mere 14 years after Vespasian's destruction of Jerusalem, this is obviously very strong historical evidence directly from a first century eyewitness, tying in the Sabbath with the recurring seven-day cycle of the Romans, 63 BCE to 229 CE. Cassius Dio, a Roman historian who lived from 155 to 229 CE, using the historical annals of the Roman Empire, wrote about three battles which the Roman Empire had with the Jews. The first battle was during a time when Hyrcanus II and Aristobulus II, two brothers who were the offspring of the Maccabees, were engaged in a dispute over who would rule. The Romans, through the actions of Pompey, came in and settled the dispute, siding with Hyrcanus. While speaking of Pompey's battle, the Sabbath is mentioned. The setting is 63 BCE. Most of the city, to be sure, he took without any trouble, as he received by the party of Hyconus. But the temple of itself, which the other party had occupied, he captured only with difficulty, for it was on high ground, and was fortified by a wall of its own, and if they had continued defending it on all days alike, he could not have gotten possession of it. 
as it was, they made an excavation of what are called the days of Saturn. And by doing no work at all on those days afforded the Romans an opportunity in this interval to batter down the wall. The latter, on learning of this superstitious awe of theirs, made no serious attempts on the rest of the time, but on those days when they came round in succession, assaulted most vigorously. Thus the defenders were captured on the day of Saturn, without making any defense, and all the wealth was plundered. Their kingdom was given to Hyrcanus, and Aristobulus was carried away. So the Romans took advantage of the fact that the Jews would not work on the Sabbath. When was the Sabbath? Again, the weekly Sabbath coincides with the Roman days of Saturn. The second battle listed by Cassius Dio occurred in 36 BCE. This is the one that resulted in the very first King Herod coming to power. The Jews indeed had done much injury to the Romans, but they suffered far more themselves. The first of them to be captured were those who were fighting for the precinct of their God, and then the rest on the day even then called the day of Saturn. And so excessive were they in their devotion to religion that the first set of prisoners, those who had been captured along with the temple, obtained leave from Sosius when the day of Saturn came around again, and went up into the temple, and there performed all customary rites together with the rest of the people. These people Antony entrusted to a certain Herod to govern, but Antigonus he bound to a cross and flogged, a punishment no other king had suffered at the hands of the Romans, and afterwards slew him. Note that Cassius Dio reports the Jews as keeping customary rites at the temple on the day of Saturn. Next, he records that the 70 CE Jerusalem destruction was on the Sabbath, which he again calls the day of Saturn. Thus was Jerusalem destroyed on the very day of Saturn, the day which even now the Jews reverence most. From that time forth, it was ordered that the Jews who continue to observe their ancestral customs should pay an annual tribute of two denarii to Jupiter Capitolinae. In consequence of this success, both generals received the title of imperator, but neither got that of Judaicus, although all the other honors that were fitting on the occasion of so magnificent a victory, including triumphal arches, were voted to them. So his report is that the Jews kept the Sabbath on the day of Saturn, from 63 BCE up until his day, no later than 229 CE. His report also agrees with Frontinius' account of the 70 CE battle. 100 CE. The historian Cornelius Tacitus, after suggesting that the Jews kept the Sabbath out of laziness, also associated the Sabbath with the Roman idol Saturn. They are said to have devoted the seventh day to rest, because that day brought an end to their troubles. Later, finding idleness alluring, they gave up the seventh year as well to sloth. Others maintain that they do this in honor of Saturn, either because their religious principles are derived from the Idae, who are supposed to have been driven out with Saturn and become the ancestors of the Jewish people, or else because of the seven constellations which govern the lives of men, the star of Saturn moves in the topmost orbit and exercises peculiar influence, and also because most of the heavenly bodies move round their courses in multiples of seven. Again, the fact that a pagan associated Sabbath keeping with Saturn demonstrates that the Roman week's day of Saturn, Saturday, was concurrent with what Yahweh calls the Sabbath day. Tacitus is an eyewitness from the first century who has no axe to grind in regards to when the Sabbath should be observed. He wrote this a mere 30 years after the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. And the Romans have no bias, and they have no agenda, they have no skin in the game in regards to when the Sabbath is kept.
Yeah, she was. In the morning light, take my hand. 